Hello, I'm Noah. And I am talking about R, as Struthers said. Uh, R is a statistical uh, analysis language that will blow your mind. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be blowing your mind tonight because I'm not talking about R uh, as much as I am talking about the implementation of R into Ruby. Uh, so just so I can get a feel, has anyone uh, used R before? All right. Uh, anyone heard of R before? Okay. Uh, all right. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, R is R is a language. Uh, it's based off of S, which is based off of C, or rather influenced by uh, the languages. Uh, so it is its own language, um, and it's really pretty. So uh, the whole language is designed so that when you are doing things that are specifically involved or dealing with numbers, it's really focused on making that process really, really simple. So uh, if you take something like a matrix, which is R's version of a two-dimensional array. Um, so um, basically the same thing in R as uh, uh, one, two, three, one, two, three. R likes to call that a matrix, right? Same thing. Um, and um, if you want to add these in Ruby or pretty much any other language, you have to do some kind of loop uh, where you or map uh, on, uh, on, this, on these matrices so that you can increment them or multiply them. Uh, whereas in R, you can just take one matrix and add it to another language, or take one matrix, add it to another matrix, and that's it. Right? Yeah. Come on. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So it's pretty fucking awesome, right? Um, so go home and study R tonight, um, just so that I can um, come through this. Uh, I'm also I'm not an expert in R by any means. Uh, if I got hired to do a job in R, I would definitely get fired. Um, but um, I am a fanboy of it. So. Uh, some of the terminology that R will use, uh, variables, well, they call them variables, uh, but this is the variable assignment. So uh, that syntax is the, the equivalent of x equals 27 in Ruby. So just like in Ruby where you can do um, x plus 1, you can do x plus 1 with that too. Um, it's just a different assignment. Um, vectors are just uh, arrays. They call them vectors because they're assholes. Um, <laughs> So, uh, and they want to make things confusing. So, uh, when you define a vector to make things simple, uh, you do it with a C, and then that is your vector. Um, and then you can also do a sequence, which is nice. So, if you want to do a uh, array of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, you do 1, 10, which is nice. Uh, matrices, I showed those a little bit earlier, um, just a two dimensional array. So, Continue. Um, like I said, this isn't really talk about R itself, but that you can use R in uh, inside of Ruby. Uh, most people are under the impression uh, that, at least I think they are, um, that you can only use R in Python if you want to use it with another language, uh, which is a complete lie, um, and you don't have to do that. So you can use R in other languages and not lose your soul. Okay, I'll make that bigger and bold it. Um, <laughs> So it's very simple to not use uh, R with the language which shall not be named, and it's as simple as this. So you install a gem called R in Ruby, or Rin Ruby, and then you just require it, and then you can use R inside of your code. Um, so uh, by doing this, it's, uh, you can just use these data functions, which are uh, normally harder to do, uh, or just more work to do inside of Ruby, and you just do it uh, right inside of R, and you get the result of that. So to get you an example, um, if you want to normalize uh, a number, uh, you do an eval statement. So this r.eval is actually saying, run this R code. Um, and we're doing a variable assignment here to normie. And we pull out normie. And that comes out as an array in Ruby. So that's not an R. Uh, that's not a Rin Ruby object. That's an actual array that was done, that was uh, calculated using R, which is, uh, which is pretty handy. 
Um, so other things, uh, graphs and charts are really big in R. Um, that's kind of, I guess it's claim to fame. So with one line of code, which I'll show you in a little bit, uh, you just can make a bar graph, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, you can fit your Ren Ruby to do a few other things. Uh, it's actually not that impressive. Um, and then um, you can feed data from R into Ruby. So I showed you pulling out the R stuff and putting it into Ruby and using it inside your Ruby code. But you can also take Ruby code and things that were resulted uh, that were a result of your Ruby code and throw them into R and then play with it that way as well. Uh, okay, so now we get to show some stuff off. Uh, so our first step when wanting to use uh, R, can you guys see that okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, when wanting to use uh, R in Ruby is just to do require rin, uh, hold on, okay. Require rin Ruby. Uh, I already have the gem installed, so I don't need to do anything. Um, and now it is installed. If I run rin Ruby, you can see rin Ruby shows up. Um, now, if I just want to create a basic variable, uh, so this is just going to go through actually uh, pulling data from R. Um, I'm going to write in a val statement, which is x27. Uh, so creating a variable x and assigning it to 27. Does that, does that all make sense so far? OK. Um, so we created that. It puts out a bunch of stuff, which just frightened me uh, the first time that happened. Uh, you, actually, you only have to know that, it's, that it worked. So that's it. Um, so it worked. Um, and if we want to pull it out, there's two ways we can do it. Uh, I'm going to show you the harder way first, um, which is just to do a r.pull, and then our variable, pull out x, uh, and there is 27 down at the bottom. So there was the number we put in. Exciting, right? Um, so that was all r. Um, now, we can also just pull it out by doing r.x. Um, and we can modify this as much as we want, um, which we'll jump into assigning uh, or putting, putting data into R. Um, so if I wanted to change this to be 30, I could set r.x to 30. If I run r.x again, pulls it out from R. And if we do r.pull uh, x, there's our 30. Uh, and let's say we want to do some math with that. So x plus 10, um, r dot x. Oh, that didn't work. Oops. Uh, I have to assign it. Right. r dot x. OK, 40. So um, that was a long way of saying that that all works. Uh, so does that all make sense? That stuff, yeah. Uh, you can also work with arrays inside of this. So uh, if you wanted to do. Uh, r dot, oh, uh, you can also do r dot assign uh, for assigning uh, variables. So you can do uh, r dot assign x, assign it to 10. Um, so you can do r dot x, that gives you 10, though it's much easier just to write r dot x for your variable, assign it to 10. Um, you can also assign arrays to it, uh, r dot x equals 1, 2, 3, and that gives you your information. Um, now, the real fun stuff comes with uh, creating um, bar graphs, um, creating graphs with, within Ruby. So I created this little, um, little piece of code here. The top of it will look a little bit more familiar because it's full on Ruby code. Um, I haven't written any R inside of it yet. Uh, so I have this uh, function at the top, which is get keys and count. And it's going through a text file I have. Um, um, which is just the transcript of the uh, uh, Miss South, South Carolina speech from, I think, 2007. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a bar chart of um, the words she uses the most, right? So uh, this very important task would normally uh, take quite a bit of time and quite a bit of code to write inside of Ruby. But we don't have a lot of time, so we're going to use R for it. Um, our basic stuff, though, uh, creating a hash of all the words and figuring out how many times those uh, words have been used 
we're creating that inside an array, so, or I'm sorry, a hash. So we create a hash at the top, open up the text file, and then we parse through that whole text file, and then increment every time uh, that word has been used. Does that all make sense? Yes, okay. And at the end, we just return the keys and the values. So from what I was shown earlier, uh, we're doing an assignment um, of the uh, R, R variable. So we have a keys variable and accounts variable that we're creating, and that is the uh, keys and values that's returned. Is everybody familiar with the syntax of the? I will get to that in a sec. Okay. That's kind of a fun thing. Um, uh, does everybody, everybody know the syntax with the, uh, uh, the comma? On line 12, yeah. Yeah. All right, so we get the keys, we get the counts, and those are available in R. So if we went into R and said, give me all the keys, uh, or the words, then uh, we would get a list of all those words. So uh, EOF is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, people who um, understand this better, but uh, it essentially just allows you to take a, um, uh, a long string and write it basically in a paragraph form. It's called here doc, the EF is right. Here doc, yeah. yes. Um, does that make sense? Uh, long string, you don't have to put quotes around it. Uh, and you can do multiple lines with it, it's kind of the benefit of it. Um, so you, yeah, just to clarify, the EOF can be replaced with anything. So if you put hello for the first opening of your string, hello would be how you close it as well. So just a unique identifier for that string. Sorry. No, no, thank you. Uh, so we're going to actually write our, um, our code inside of there. So that way, um, it's, it's a little bit longer, not much though. Um, it'll just be a little bit cleaner to write inside of there. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to do is I actually want to make this data so that the bar chart can read it really well. Um, and I just want to tell R that the words and the numbers go together. So when you're creating a bar chart, all R really cares about is the numbers. It wants to know how high each bar goes. But for our purposes, we also want to see the names attached with it because um, otherwise the data is completely useless if we don't know what we're reading. Uh, so the way we tell, uh, we give R the actual values is to give it uh, names. Uh, so it knows that we're going to be throwing in names to this data. We're going to be attaching names to each data point. Um, and then we pass it in uh, counts, uh, which is just the values of R uh, of our words, how many times they've been used. And then to throw in the actual words so we can read them out, uh, we are just going to give it, uh, what did I call it? Uh, counts. No, 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 keys. Yeah, keys. So um, each key gets thrown into the, uh, to each number. They're in the same order, so R knows just to match them up. Uh, now we can actually just create our bar chart. So we have, we have our numbers related to our words, um, our counts related to our words. So our bar plot will create. Um, we just have to feed it the counts. Uh, so it's set up on line 15. Uh, that's not right. Uh, bar plot counts. And then uh, we can actually title the bar plot that's going to be created. Uh, so we'll call it frequency of words used. And that's it. That's all we have to do. Um, and it's going to create a bar, bar plot for us. Uh, so if we actually run our code, it is going to open up, look at that, bar plot. We didn't have to do any kind of special coding for that. It just magically worked, thanks to R. Um, <laughs> go ahead and sync that in. Um, so that's just kind of a taste of R and how to use it inside of Ruby. Um, I would highly suggest looking into uh, R itself. I have a couple of resources at the end of how you can uh, learn more about R. Um, some practical uses of R. Um, Mozilla is really big into data. Um, OkCupid is another tech company that's also big into data. They both use R. Uh, so this is just a plot of how uh, Mozilla is looking at all the different uh, web UI elements um, that users are using um, and the frequency of them. Um, Foursquare uses R for their recommendations engine. Kickstarter uses R 
for determining what projects are going to be the most likely to be fully backed. Um, ANZ Bank is an Australian bank, um, which uh, tries to determine the credit worthiness of their, uh, their customers by using R. Um, and then uh, there are other banks that use it as well, such as Bank of America. The FDA is also really well known for using uh, R as well as sharing it with the science community. Uh, schools are huge into R, so pretty much any time you go out and Google, I need help with this in R, some university has written a, uh, has written a topic in that, which is very different from like a Ruby topic, which would have been um, written by some guy on his blog. Um, so, in summary, just uh, use R, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Um, and Ruby is a beautiful thing, so use them together. Um, if you want more resources, the R project is the kind of host for R. Stats.stackexchange.com is the statistics home. That's where you'd go for any kind of R help instead of Stack Overflow. Um, and then, uh, like I said, every university uh, that has some kind of statistics course will be using R. John Hopkins has a fantastic data analysis course, uh, actually about four of them, which I am a, uh, they're, they're available free on Coursera. I'm a proud dropout of them. Um, but uh, they're very good starters. Um, other than that, um, the Rin Ruby project is available online. The documentation is pretty short. Um, it's actually about as long as this presentation. Uh, so it's pretty easy to read through. So uh, definitely check it out and try out R. Hello. Um, didn't really make the presentation. I didn't realize so many people from Omaha school, Code School would be here too, so that's cool to see. Um, so they'll, they already know half to 90% of what I'm going to talk about anyway. Um, but yeah, I'm here to talk to you today as someone who went through a dev boot camp experience um, and just kind of what happened since then. Um, basically, I got hired by my current employer, Woodhouse Auto Family. Um, you've probably seen their commercials, love their commercials. Um, basically, uh, they hired me on out of school. I did a two-year degree at Metro for front-end web development, kind of learned HTML, CSS, the basics of that. Didn't really know anything about database design or code, anything like that. Experimented with .NET a little bit with that, PHP, but didn't know a whole lot of that. Um, they hired me on with the anticipation that they'd find somebody else who knew how to do Rails, handle Ruby, handle the back end, and while I would handle the front end. Um, worked there for about three months, and they kept trying to hire somebody. They had been hi trying to hire someone for a year before that. They were trying to hire that person first before they hired me and just never found anybody. And jokingly, I was looking online, trying to find where do we find Rails developers, people who know Ruby in the area, and I stumbled across Dev Boot Camp online in Chicago, sending people there to teach people to learn how to do Ruby on Rails. Jokingly kind of dropped the brochure and information on my boss's desk on like a Friday and said, you, know, you can send me here if you want to. I'm willing to learn it if you can't find anybody, find anybody to hire. And basically came in Monday and they said, you know, I want to go to Chicago. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't think, I wasn't really serious about that. Had to talk to my wife. Um, decided, yeah, you know, it wasn't really where I thought I was going to go in my career. I kind of wanted to lean towards front end just simply because back end scared me and coding scared me. I could handle visual and design and HTML and CSS pretty easily. And then I kind of realized, well, you know, I kind of fell into it easily and I don't really feel challenged there. Why not? Why not go for it? I have a situation where my employer is going to put me through it. So that's kind of a unique situation. A lot of people who go to these code schools quit their jobs, you know, leave their current career and decide that this is kind of a gamble of a quick way of changing course in their life and their career and spending a lot of money to go there um, to hopefully come out on the other end with a job. Um, I don't know about Omaha Code School, but one of the biggest things about Dev Boot Camp is that they promise at the end they're going to help you with resources and networking that as soon as you finish the nine-week course, you'll basically be able to find a career if you just do the right thing. So, um, so basically, yeah, I mean, my story goes that they sent me there. Um, before I actually went, there was nine weeks of prep to get yourself ready for the course material that you're going to be using. It's all basically learning Ruby some other fundamentals of web development. Um, just spending a lot of time with Ruby, though, initially, just making sure that you can get your head into it. Uh, that was nine weeks of devoting 20 to 30 hours a week 
to just the preparation phase of it. Uh, at the end of that, they did an assessment. Uh, if you pass the assessment, they said, okay, now you actually come to do the actual nine-week program. And it's split into three phases, uh, three weeks per phase. Uh, the first three weeks was essentially spent mainly in Ruby, doing Ruby console-driven programs, eventually getting up to uh, more complicated things, classes, kind of emulating the MVC framework within just Ruby environment. Um, the second week they introduced more, or I should say the second phase, which is the fourth, fifth, and sixth week, they introduced more web-based things, uh, HTML, CSS for those especially who went into it not knowing any of it, um, and then start introducing Ruby and everything else, Active Record, uh, with that through Sinatra, um, kind of teaching you the MVC framework through Sinatra. They used a specific version of Sinatra that was kind of set up like Rails, so you became familiar with that. So that in the third and final phase, they immediately switch you over to Rails and kind of just drop it on you and say, <coughs> you have a final project due. At the end of three weeks, you group up with people and do that. And so that's kind of my a quick version of, of my time through the code school. Um, basically, going through that, as somebody who didn't know anything about backend development coming out, I felt like I learned so much that I was overwhelmed. Uh, in my unique position, I came back to a job that had a project ready for me to jump into, and they needed somebody who knew what this class was teaching me. And so I immediately got to apply some of the skills that I learned when I got back, um, just jumping into exactly what I was learning at the code school. I think Omaha Code School, you guys here, I talked to you before this, and that you're learning a lot of the same things. And it seems like that might be what all the code schools are learning, which is great. So um, I didn't realize so many people were going to be here, so I was going to probably actually open it up to a few questions before I go too far, if you have any questions. Go ahead. Yeah, how did you uh, handle like, set up configuration once you got back to Woodhouse? When I came back, um, the, for me, and they recommend this for everybody that goes to the program, is to come with your own like, laptop, your own work environment because they help you configure it there. And so when you're finally out on your own and doing your own thing, it's already set up <coughs> and configured. Um, a lot of people realized how important that was during the, that they actually went out and found ways of buying computers while they were there. A lot of students who went through the program were now upgrading, so they were selling their old equipment back to other students, that type of thing, as they were exiting. Um, so I didn't have to worry too much about getting back and being like, where do I start? I was set up and ready to go. I mean, I, I was, for me, I was in a unique position going there for my job. and my job provided me with a computer for my job, and I brought that with me and set it up, and then brought it back, and I was pretty much ready to go. Now, I came back, and I had uh, the help of Agape. Uh, they're backing us up in the project since I'm a complete newbie at all, all of this, and they essentially helped me finish anything you know, with that. Um, there's a lot of interesting resources online that I'm going through because I, I went through such a unique experience that I'm trying to find. Like, for example, I'm trying to set up other machines for a development environment. And I'm actually finding tons of inconsistent resources that tells you how to actually initially set up like a Rails environment. Like nobody has one unique, like this is what you need to do to get yourself going. But I think if you understand the basics of everything that you need to, to get going well enough, you can kind of pick that from all of them and, and kind of take it from there and just kind of test and fail what works. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Yeah, no, that's okay. A Mac. a Mac, yeah. And I noticed, for me, I don't know what it's like at your code school, all you saw were apples on the back of people's computers. If someone came up there with a Windows PC, two weeks later they had a Mac. It's just easier to develop on them, for it, from what I understand. Um, uh, you can also use a Windows machine and install something like Ubuntu on it. And for, I haven't set it up on Linux yet, but I understand it's pretty similar. So, yeah. Relearning what I've already learned. Um, so much information was thrown at me in a short amount of time that you're frustrated when, like, for instance, when I came back, I focused so much on certain things that were separate from what I learned that some things I learned kind of fell to the floor. So now when I'm getting other things, uh, particularly like when I came out of it, 
I was doing more front end stuff still and not jumping directly into Active Record and the database side of it. So when I finally came to do some changes that involved changes in Active Record, I almost felt like, did, have I even done this before? You know, didn't I go to code school to learn this? And it's basically going back. I kept really good resources, took really good notes, and kind of basically going back and teaching myself again. It's just in a much more condensed amount of time, obviously. So um, that's the hardest thing to deal with is just organizing your information because you can't possibly remember how to do it. I mean, I guess some people can. I'm not a genius, so knowing how to do that. That's it. What I don't, for my unique position, there's nothing that I wish I would have done differently. I almost wish my circumstances were different in a way. Um, I could see myself, if I wasn't going here for a job and I was going there on my own, on my own dime to do this, to try to find a job, I could see so much potential in that kind of experience of doing it. Um, it's a huge gamble. It's a lot of money if you're paying for this out of your own pocket. And if it ends up being something that's frustrating for you, you don't want to do it for a career, you know, that's a huge thing to put a lot into in such a short amount of time. And uh, for me, if I wasn't going there for my own job, I feel like I'd have much more of a chance to experiment and try different things and, and see to almost get more out of it. I'm so focused now on doing what my job needs me to do in specific areas that I don't really have an opportunity to experiment. Say, I really like this during code school. I'm going to experiment with that more and kind of go off on this. You know, it's like, why? Well, went there to learn a specific skill set, now I have to apply skills at a certain time when they need me to do a certain thing. And so that's the only thing I wish I could change about it is that I'm forgetting some of these other things I learned because I just haven't had the opportunity or time to apply them. And it's like if I was a person in your position and none of you have jobs and doing this for a job, I would totally latch on to what you enjoyed the most about it and drive with that very quickly. So. Yeah. My side projects are work related, so yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing too is that they hired me, and I'm still the only web developer there. Um, eventually, they're still going to hire another web developer, and we toss a ton of stuff to Agape, who works in this environment. And they, if without them, I'd still be lost. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> Any other? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, I just was kind of curious. How uh, structured was your preparation? Was that something that you did in school? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was just as structured as the actual program. It was mostly self-driven. Um, a lot of it centered around completing challenges every day. You'd wake up in the morning and get your challenges list, and you just have like, I have to write 10 programs that day, and just be like, OK, this is what I'm going to be doing for the entire day. And they had you know, core set of challenges they wanted you to do, do for the day. You also had reading, lots of books that they threw at you. Uh, understanding the culture of what it's going to be like when you get to the boot camp to kind of work because a lot of it too is teaching you how to work with other people and groups and collaborate when you program and they drive uh, agile de development and pair programming a lot. I don't know if they do a ton of pair programming but and just how you interact with your partner and so lots of stuff with, with that. It's very structured. They have a list for you to do. You do it. You get it done and for me it's almost like if I felt like I was deficient in an area I would go off on my own and try to find resources. They point you in the direction of resources that you don't have to do, but they're saying there's other stuff over here if you have time you can do it, you know, like code schools online that you can delve into tutorials and that type of thing. So lots of doing that. Awesome. Thanks. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>Okay, I guess everybody can see that, all right. So today we're gonna talk about OmniAuth. I'm going to, wow, this is way different resolution. It was a second ago. Hold on a second, that doesn't look right at all. Can I change that? Okay, much better. Um, so yeah, we're gonna be talking about um, OmniAuth. Uh, so a lot of times in, when you're setting up a new app, um, you don't want to waste time on creating yet another username and password system for yet another app. So you might just want to authenticate using Twitter or Facebook or GitHub or Steam or many, many others. OmniAuth is a tool that makes that uh, relatively easy, so it's a gem for Ruby. Um, it has lots of strategies. The uh, aforementioned Twitter and, and Facebook and GitHub and Azure and Cloud Factory and Google and anything else you could imagine. There's, there's dozens of them. Um, 
so we're going to go through, we're going to start with a really simple um, application. Um, and we are going to upgrade it to add, add OmniAuth. Um, so pretty, pretty should be pretty straightforward. So let me restart it. Um, so this is just a really simple application. I wanted an application where I could play with the Twitter and Facebook APIs a little more. So I just made this thing called Social Console. And it's just going to let me play with the APIs. Right now, it's not wired up for any. We're not authenticated and it doesn't really do anything. So, so it's just a pretty simple Rails app that uses Bootstrap. Nothing, nothing real special there, pretty skeleton. Uh, but we're going to start adding to it. So the first step we got to do is um, the things we're going to go through today is uh, we're going to add the OmniAuth gem to the project. Uh, we're going to set up the authentication through Twitter and Facebook. And then we're also going to do a little, make, play with the API a little bit more by, by adding this inspector JavaScript and uh, showing you how to access APIs a little more directly on the console So once, once we've got everything authenticated. So let's first start with the, um, the authentication. So I'm going to, um, so, so I don't have to actually live code. I'm going to check out one of the commits. So if you guys want to review this, I have, um, I have, where did it go? It was up for a second. This, uh, this project's all online, and uh, all the changes we're making today are in a pull request. And so you can review them. And uh, so if you want more details, if I'm going too fast for you or something, you can always come back and look at all the, the changes in detail with their explanations. Um, so we're going to start, and we're going to add the OmniAuth gem to the project. So that all we're doing there, let me go back. So all we're doing there is just adding a couple gems. So you'll just see these two, these two gems got added. Um, now you just do your bundle install, and it'll set that up. And we can start the, restart the app. And so now we have OmniAuth, but we're going to need more than that. So we're going to jump forward a few paces, and I'll go over. Um, I'm using a lot of Git shortcuts, sorry. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and add all the, the Twitter and stuff. So what this first involves, like you have to set up the OmniAuth initializer. So after you add the gem, you're going to have something that has to start up when, when Rails starts up. This might look a little complicated, but all it's doing here really is reading this OmniAuth uh, YAML file. And then if the Twitter provider is present, it's going to add the provider for Twitter with the API key and API secret. Uh, this is what I had to do so that you guys don't have my API key in secret, so you can't access my Twitter account. So, um, but I'll show you what that looks like. So, so I have a sample file here, so you can look at that. So if, if you go to your Twitter application, so if you want to, um, you can create a new app, like once you're logged in, and you can go into your apps, and you can get the, uh, the API keys from, from here. So these are just the API keys you'd find in Twitter once you create a new application. So you put those in, uh, pretty straightforward, and you have that initializer that takes those, um, takes those API keys and adds, and um, uses the OmniAuth middleware uh, to add the the Twitter OmniAuth provider. So how OmniAuth works is it sits between your Rails app and the rest of the world as a what's called rack middleware, and so when it detects that you're doing trying to authenticate with Twitter, um, it's going to take over those requests and handle that for you, so you don't have to deal with that manually. Um, and then it'll pass any result of that on your application. So then the next step after you've added OmniAuth is you're going to need a controller to handle the OmniAuth callback. So and let's go to the routes as well. So OmniAuth is going to, once it's done authenticating, it's going to go to auth and then the name of the provider and callback. And right now I just have that rerouting to uh, the user's controller, the callback function. And so that just looks like this. And so we have, um, we're going to create a new credential record from the auth data. The auth data is just this data right here that OmniAuth has put into the, the environment. So once OmniAuth is finished authenticating with Twitter or Facebook or whoever, it's going to populate this, this little uh, variable in, through Rack in, in the environment. And then you're going to, we're going to take these, create a new credential record, and then if the users doesn't exist, we're going to create a new user from that record. Uh, and then 
if the user does exist or, or not. Either way, once, once the user exists, we're going to add that credential to the user. So, so this way, you can actually be logged in. The, the Social Console, once we're done with it, will allow us to log into multiple sites. So you'll be able to authenticate. And you can have multiple Twitter accounts or multiple Facebook accounts. So if, you're, uh, if you want to see how to maybe aggregate uh, data for multiple social networking uh, sites, this, this would be a good example to use. So it's got a one-to-many relationship between your user and your credentials. And we'll actually look at those models a little closer. Um, so create. So these are our two migrations. This is like the minimum you need to do OAuth. Like we're just going to need something to identify the network and the ID. So we just have this auth key that, that does both. And then the credentials are, has the same auth key, uh, points back to the user. So you can do the, that's the one-to-many relationship. And then we're also going to store all of the auth data we get from OAuth so we can inspect that a little. And you can see exactly what, what's coming back from Facebook and Twitter. Um, so that's how, how that works. So after the user controller sets up uh, the new credential, makes sure that the user is logged in and created and, and adds that credential to the user, then it's just going to go to this user's URL, uh, which actually just takes you here and just shows you the, the details for the current user. So we'll look at that view. Um, and it's just going to go through each of the credentials for that user and uh, display them. So it uses this JSON pretty generate. So it's going to take all the JSON we get from OAuth and, uh, and display it out to you. So we'll have a look at what that looks like now. So now we have our social console. If we refresh, hopefully there'll be login buttons. I'm actually still logged in. I need to log out. Hold on. Um, so you can see what the login looks like. Let's go ahead and. Yeah, so we'll sign in um, as through Twit. That's not good. Live coding. Um, let's try that. OK, I may not have restarted for the OmniAuth. Uh, what? Oh, OK. My actual Twitter credentials need to be added to the project that I've been hiding. All right. So your app, the actual app API needed to be added. So now we should be able to start that. All right, so now I should be able to sign in through Twitter. And Twitter got the request, and it redirected me immediately. And we see all this data. Now, it's a bit of a blob, like just a bunch of, of text here. Let me get rid of this one. Um, that's a little overwhelming. So we're going to add this, uh, this little tool called Inspector.js. And uh, that is two. So that's pretty simple. So Inspector.js just takes all this JSON and makes it a little easier to navigate. And so now. Now we can browse that a bit easier. So I, there's just a bit of wire up there. If you want to see how that was done, it's, it's pretty simple. But um, just a library that lets us go through that. So you can see once you log in, when you log into Twitter, it gives you all this data. data. So we have some basic data about the u users. We have the tokens and secret that we're going to need if we want to actually access the Twitter API, more of the Twitter API and everything else. And so now, now that's all set up. So, Pretty, pretty straightforward for how that works. Um, we've added a, a bit there. We added delete link. Um, so now we're going to add, so we can actually make this a social console instead of a Twitter console. We're going to add the Facebook. Um, Facebook login. So all that involved is we went into our SAMP, we went into our YAML file. We had another one for Facebook. Put the API for for Facebook. What permissions we wanted to use, and then that ended up modifying the startup. So, if the Facebook permission is present, we put that API and keys in secret, and we get all the permissions list, and we um, put them together, separated by commas, and we pass that off to the OmniAuth. So that that's just telling Facebook which permissions we're going to request. So you have they'll determine what what parts of the API you have access to. Um, and so we'll see what that, that looks like. So now we should have both set up. And we should be able to authenticate. I think I have to restart the server here. 
um, I added a gem. So every time you add a new provider for Omnioth, it's also going to mean an extra gem too. So that's how that works. If you want to add Facebook or Twitter or GitHub or Steam, you're just going to keep adding, adding gems and then adding corresponding provider lines in your, in your uh, initializer. So now we have a button to log in through Facebook. So we're going to try and adding that. And it should just redirect back. And it did. And so now you'll see we have two credentials. We have the one for Twitter and the one for Facebook. And just to prove that we can do multiple accounts, I'm going to go ahead and sign out of my personal Twitter account and sign into another one. This is where I put cheap cars on Twitter. And, um, and so now if I add a Twitter account, sign in through Twitter, it's going to sign in through um, the, the other account, the Lemons Omaha. And so we'll be able to see that in our list of credentials. So we have the first Twitter, which is for my personal account, Existential. And then we have a Facebook login. And then we have a second Twitter, which is for the other, the Lemons Omaha. And so, um, so that's all set up. So now we've, we've got basic authentication working. We've got logging in, logging out, um, which just to revisit. So the logging in happens through the callback. Logging out, all we're doing is the session URL we set up during the login, this current user ID, we're just milling that out. So that's how logout works. So it's pretty, pretty simple. So it's not, not, it's not very difficult to set up OmniAuth. And now that you have OmniAuth set up and you have these credentials saved, now we have everything we need to play with these APIs. So now I have the tokens for this user. I have the tokens for this user. And so I can play with it. And so I went a little step further. And in the credentials model, we added this thing called a client. So based on each type of client, we'll go ahead and set up the Twitter gem um, for, for you with all of those tokens for that user. Or we'll go ahead and set up the Facebook gem for you with the token for that user. And so that's going to allow us to play with these credentials on the console. So if we start the Rails console, now we'll see that we have uh, all these, I did, that's singular. We have all these credentials, um, two for Twitter, one for Facebook. And so if we take um, the one for Lemons Omaha and um, we ask it for the client, it's going to return to us this Twitter client. Uh, that's through the Twitter gem. and um, and now we can ask that client for our home timeline. So we can use this to explore the Twitter API a little. You can see all these tweets. We're going to call that, add that to tweets. And we're going to pick the first one and ask for its text. And so, you know, it's, it's pulling in the, the tweets from Twitter. And you can manipulate that. There's plenty of more data there. You can ask it for its. You can either go to the Twitter API doc documentation, or you can just play around in the console. You can ask it for its methods. You'll see that there's um, all these different methods in there. Um, and so you can use that to try and, oh, ask for the tweets. That's an array. Um, so you can see all these um, methods. So you can see the in reply to screen name. So if you want a quick way to access that, you can go in reply. This one actually should be blank since uh, there's no replies. Um, but so yeah, so it's null. Um, so now we have successfully made a social console. It doesn't work through the web yet. I'd like to expand this, and it's on GitHub if anybody wants to help me, because I'm always playing with APIs like this. So uh, if you if you want to help make this actually work in the browser, that'd be great. But for now, we can do that, and so we can do the same thing with Twitter. So or uh, Facebook. So let's go back. See those credentials. You see that four um, is the um, Facebook one, we can ask it for its client. Facebook looks, works a little different. We have to do ask for me home. And then we have the same thing with Facebook. We have your home timeline, or your whatever they call it on Facebook, the, uh, your home news stream. And so you can look through and see everything that's going on. So, um, so if you wanted to design an app that used this data or ingested data from Facebook or Twitter, this would be a great place to start. Or if you just want to see a good example of how to uh, integrate Omnioth, you might want to check out this app. But regardless, Omnioth is a great tool. So if you just have something simple you want to put together, you don't want to have yet another username and password that people have to remember, um, Omnioth provides a really great, simple way um, 
to, um, to make that really easy. So yeah, I highly recommend that gem. And if you want to see um, what we did, what, what I did here today in action, uh, in a little more detail, just go my, my user, GitHub username is Carl Zuloff. I'll put that on um, this whole link here on uh, the Meetup page. But the project's just called Social Console. You can look at the only pull request out there uh, right now, and it'll show you how I added OmniAuth. And then eventually I'm going to expand on this, add in other, uh, some other networks, and do some more playing with APIs for my own stuff. So if anybody wants to help me with that, feel free. Um, but if you're just looking for simple authentication, um, just go to the OmniAuth gem on Twitter. Uh, and you'll find um, some guides for setting it up, and you'll find uh, the list of the providers, which is very large. Basically, if you can imagine somebody uh, that has OAuth, they, there's probably already a gem set up for it. So, quite a few. Um, so yeah, it's a pretty pretty quick way to to not have to deal with yet another username and password. If anybody has any questions. Uh, Okay. Well, I guess that's it. Okay. So, real quick, I just wanted to start by improving your lives like I always like to do when I start a talk. Uh, this is the Contigo coffee mug. Nice thing about it is you can put a hot coffee in this thing. It will stay pretty hot for, for quite a while. You can turn it upside down. I've actually shake, shaken it over Alex's head before and he's still lived to tell the tale. Um, and my biggest breakthrough with it um, was this morning in the shower I realized that because uh, coffee doesn't get out unless you've got the trigger pressed. It also means water doesn't get in if you don't have the trigger pressed. And I realized I could drink coffee in the shower. So <laughs> now that we've covered the basics, <laughs> I'd like to tell you a little bit about, so you've decided you need an API, right? This talk is actually called How to API Quickly with Sinatra, Sketching and Prototyping Services Impatiently. Um, but we've been sitting here for a minute, so I'd like to get the blood up a little bit. I'm going to say, hi, everybody, and if you'd indulge me, I'd like you to all say, hi, Dr. Nick. Okay? So, one, two, three. Hi, everybody! Hi, Dr. Nick! Excellent! All right. So, why on earth? Oh, and I'm Andy. Sorry, I should mention that. I'm Andy. Um, I uh, work at, here at Agape Red, and I wisecrack sometimes um, at Raving Logic on uh, Twitter. That's my handle. But, uh, like I said, why would we want an API? Impatiently. Well, in my case, it started like a lot of my relationship with technology does. I had a need. Uh, I do iOS development here uh, at Agape Red, and we had a client that um, needed me to build something that could, you could put your username and your password into it, it could log into their service, and then it would return a big list of stuff, useful things. I can't really tell you what it was because of the NDA, but, and then eventually you'd want to log out. And, you know, the, the part was that really kind of was kind of holding me back was it didn't exist yet. What I did have was a few list of requirements, and I had Xcode ready to go, and we had a little bit of decisions made about the app, but I didn't really have anything to code against. I could kind of like hope for the best and sort of hook up my networking code and just really kind of go back and sort of hope I didn't have any fires to put out. But I, I kind of wanted it to, to work, you know, from the get-go and maybe need some adjustment later. So it's no problem, right? I'll just make it myself. I'll just set something up. I mean, I'm also a web developer here, so I'll just put all this stuff together myself. And, that's no problem. We'll just make a three-tier business app, right? And you know, you code school uh, whiz kids know exactly what that means. I mean, we're talking about JSONs, technically our you know our presentation layer. Um, it's the data is being arranged in a useful way. Um, we've got logic that can take a request and figure out whether or not it's been malformed, handle errors, do useful things with a good one, and of course. You know, where do the objects go to sleep at night? Well, in the database. So we need to persist things like if I log something out, like if I expire a guy's token, how, whose account did I just expire? You know, we need, we need the state of the world to exist. So that's no problem at all. I mean, I like to use Ruby to solve problems. I'm sure you guys do too, or you wouldn't be here right now. Um, and, you know, when it comes to Ruby, there's a certain 800 pound gorilla in the room that's really hard to escape. It's pretty well known. It's, um, It'll come to me eventually, but you know, it's like there's one tool a lot of people like to reach for to solve these problems. And it's not a bad tool, actually. It's a pretty good tool, and uh, it's not bad for putting together an API either. Um, 
The only issue was, uh, it was twofold, really. Number one, this mock-up of their API wasn't actually value I was trying to deliver. I was trying to deliver an app um, that talked to something that was going to work like the thing I was mocking up quickly. So spending a bunch of time on it didn't make a lot of sense. And, and frankly, you know, as David Brady once really put uh, very well in the Ruby Rogues, you know, everything the system does for you, it also does to you. Rails does a lot of stuff for you out of the box, and that's great, but I didn't need everything it did. And occasionally, if it didn't do something exactly the way our API was going to work, I didn't want to spend a lot of time configuring it to work differently. So maybe that's where we should start thinking about Sinatra. And there's kind of a couple of differences between Sinatra. I mean, you know, if Rails is sort of an 800-pound gorilla in the room um, that brings a lot of stuff to the party, and it's also a very opinionated framework. It likes to do things in a very certain way, right? Well, Sinatra you could think of more as sort of a cute little uh, tiny baby uh, ape that reflects the personality of the person trying to put it together or the needs of the individual project. And it's only as big as it needs to be. And of course, the flip side here, too, is um, it also gives you all the, the, the uh, rope in the world to hang yourself with. It's really up to you to organize your program well, to put it together and get it working correctly. Um, but I think we'll just go ahead and put our Sinatra hat on and keep moving forward. So. Sinatra, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is really, really, really basic. You know, it's basically a way to hook up uh, requests to a web server through Rack to running Ruby code, right? If you want to implement Hello World, this is all you need. You just require the right gem, you t pick a verb and uh, give it uh, a route, and then inside your block you do your work, and in our case we're just returning a string literal. And now we're going to do a quick demo where I actually show you the thing I built. Okay, so... Actually, technically, it's not the thing I built. Uh, the awesome list of stuff I can't tell you about, I've just swapped out for contacts. So we'll just pretend that right now all you do is you log in and you'll get a list of your contacts, and then maybe you need to log out. All right. So, and I also pulled together a little Ruby script um, that would basically hit this and make these requests and then show you the output. So we'll just go ahead and uh, run our request. Our first thing, it goes to uh, login with user and password, and we get back a request token. We're going to do it again, but this time URL encoded, and we see we get back the same request token. It's still true. We made a, uh, uh, a request to our contacts, and we've got a list of those guys coming out in JSON. We'll do a login with our contact. We'll see it's expired. And we'll make uh, another request with our stale token, and we'll see that we get back an error message. And because I didn't actually hook up a request handler to uh, just a bare request to, um, to root, I'll just go ahead and make a real quick request there, and we'll see that it's handled as a bad request and re you know, return the appropriate error code. So, you know, worked out pretty well, I think. I mean, we, that looks like an API to me. And it was no problem. I mean, all we had to do was hook up a database, set up a schema, um, seed in the sample data, set up an interface to the web server, wrap the data in models, set up the accessor methods, right? I mean, well, well hold on, wait a second. I mean, what was, the, what was the point of doing all of that? Why did I skip Rails if it knows how to do all this stuff out of the box? Well, the answer is my API is a fake. <laughs> I didn't actually do any of that stuff. Um, I did actually kind of do some of that stuff. Let, let's go back to our three-tier data model. Um, we do have JSON. We have a little bit of uh, app logic, you know, that's actually was capable of responding to those requests. We skipped the database entirely. I just kind of punted on that because really, who has time? So I did the whole thing in 100 lines of code. It did give me enough for me to actually start building my app against, and it did give me useful stuff that let me get my iOS uh, um, uh, networking code pulled together and working correctly. And I did the whole thing in under 100 lines of code. And in fact, that's all 100 lines right there. I'll just sit here if you guys want to read it. Um, there'll be a short, probably pretty awkward, um, cute question and answer period afterwards. Or we can go into it in a little more detail. It's really not that bad. Now, of course, I'm going to commit two cardinal sins here, which is number one, never put your code on slides, and number two, never sit there reading your slides to the audience. But I'll try to make it as painless as possible. So the, the app is actually kind of organized pretty quickly. We just have some gems at the top. Um, let's see. We have some helper methods that actually do some work for me. 
And then we've got some routes down here that actually handle the specific requests to the different routes. And what the heck, just because I like you guys, I'll throw in a model for free. Mm -hmm. So we'll start with the gems in detail. I mean, really, all we needed was Sinatra. I went ahead and threw JSON on there because I wanted to use a couple of convenience methods that came with it. Um, as a matter of fact, we'll get into that in a second. Um, and when I was debugging and just pulling it all together, I threw pretty print in there too because who really wants to read like you know object output that's just a big long string of text that keeps wrapping in the terminal? That's gross. All right, we'll do the routes in detail, and whenever we need to touch a helper, I'll just dive into one of those real quick, and we'll probably hit the model in passing. So that, that'll be the rest of the app. First of all, our big work was logging in. So what we've got here is we've got a, a post request to log in. I, by the way, I threw a curl in the comment right there just to see well, if you wanted to hit it from the terminal yourself. This is uh, the kind of request that would actually hit this route. So basically, we take a, a request to log in, and we have a, a user and a, a password parameter. Um, now we've got a uh, we're going to throw an error unless we get back a, a, a true response from a valid login. So there's our first helper method. Now, in a time-honored tradition, I didn't have time, so I just hard-coded it. So we're li literally looking for just username and password. And then uh, we get this for free with uh, Sinatra, and we're just going to set our content type to JSON. And then we're going to call our convenience method, or helper method, a JSON response uh, render, uh, sorry, JSON response to login, which again, it's not too bad. Actually, if you just look at the top, like so what we're going to do is we're going to like make ourselves a hash. We'll throw our token into it. We'll come up with a fake account name, or a fake account number and a fake company name. Um, current valid token, well, what's that do? All right, well, what we're going to do here is if, a, if this file exists in my app, um, I'll read it. Otherwise, uh, I'll just go ahead and write it first, and then I'll read it. And we'll use generate token. Well, what's that do? Well, generate token. Again, it's just a one-liner. I was just kind of throwing it together really quickly. But basically, all you got to know is I'm just taking nine times, I'm, uh, or uh, 10 times, I'm just taking uh, uh, um, A to Z and 0 through 9, upper and lower case, and mashing it together to come up with just sort of a, you know, a token. It looks tokeny. Looks looks pretty tokeny in the terminal, didn't you think? Um, so yeah, so next thing is going to be to get our contact list. All right. Not so bad. It's just a get request to contacts. We'll throw in our error again, unless we have a valid token header, um, which we just, we're just we going to pass our whole request in. And in this case, we just go into our request, so we grab the HTTP token header, and then we compare it to something. And in this case, we'll just take whatever that was, and we'll just um, uh, compare it to whatever generated token in that file was. Again, pretty easy. Um, and then we'll set our content type again. And then we'll, what we'll do is we'll come back with a list, a sample list of size. And I just threw in a literal, like, it's going to be 1 to 12 of them, like right there. It's one of the things I love about Ruby is you can just do this stuff so very, very quickly. And if it's pretty small like this, you can just pipe the output of an operation directly into the parameter of something else you want to do. OK, this one looks a little bit hairball, but trust me, it's not that bad. All right, so basically our we'll take this many, we'll stand up a response hash with an array for a contact list, and then this many times do, we'll just generate a contact, we'll fill it full of uh, first name, last name, location, or, uh, you know, phone, et cetera, basically our, our attributes, all right? And then we'll pretty generate, that's why we included um, JSON right there, we'll pretty generate our response hash, and that's why that contact list looked so nice. Everything was all broken out and looked pretty nice and human readable. Um, well, okay, we had a couple of things kind of blow past there. Generate contact. All right, we'll go with that one. Um, I've got a dynamic uh, array of first names, a dynamic array of last names. We'll make up a phone number that's just a 10-digit US number. We'll create an email on the fly that's the first name and last name and some startup e sounding company name that we just pull together on the fly. We'll downcase the whole thing and pull it together. And then we'll feed all that to contact new and return that. Well, hold on, wait a second. Where was the contact, right? Like, so far, that's been the big payload here, and we're just kind of glancing past this guy. You know, we, I already told you we have no database. You know, so what's, what's all this about, right? Well, actually, he's the central payload of this entire operation, and we've been treating him like a bit player with, like, maybe one line to say. Well, that's actually the case. Um, and here it goes. Don't blink or you'll miss it. 
we didn't have an active record model. We didn't even, I didn't even use a, a, a capital C class, you know, keyword class anywhere in here. This is struct. Struct is actually kind of fun. Struct comes for free with Ruby. Um, and when you create a new one and you throw all those keys in there, um, it creates your uh, getters and setters for free dynamically. They can also be access. They can be accessed through dot uh, notation. They can also be accessed as keys using the, the square bracket notation. And by the way, whenever you assign the result of struct new to a constant, it changes the name of the of the of the model for you. So if you run contact and then you throw dot class on it, it comes back as contact. So all of that happened in one line of Ruby code, and I got a model for free. <laughs> Yes, yes, we know. All right, so logging out, right? So eventually you might decide you don't want your kids playing with your phone and seeing the list of awesome contacts. So basically we'll just do another get request. Again, we'll pass our contact uh, or our header and make sure it's valid. All right, we'll expire our current token, however we're doing that, and then we'll return a status 200. Well, how are we going to expire it? Well, we'll just find our temp file and destroy it. <laughs> and that's it. The next time a request comes into uh, to uh, um, get contacts, um, and it's and then the, uh, uh, the the validation method tries to find out whatever the current uh, uh, the current valid contact uh, valid token is, it's going to go looking for that file. It's not going to find it, and it's going to generate it for us. And then if it doesn't match, then it'll work. A bad request will, will generate this file for us. A good request will generate this file for us. Again, that's kind of the end of our persistence. So we've already got that taken care of. We can move on to error handling. So not found, we're just configuring. Um, we'll just throw an error 400 since that seems pretty appropriate. And for a 401, which is a bad resource, we'll, um, we'll actually just return a string literal. This is valid JSON, but it's basically just an error message. Seems like the polite thing to do when somebody's hit your, your end point and they didn't know what they were doing. So that's it, really. I mean, we've got uh, all this work done. It was under 100 lines of code. I kind of basically pulled all this together while I was teaching myself Sinatra and looking things up on Stack Overflow. So it's pretty, it was pretty easy to work with. Um, and, you know, it might be a fake, right? But the fun part is, it feels real. Like, as far as my iOS app was concerned, it was hitting a valid endpoint. Um, the other nifty thing about this was, let's just say that the guy who was, who's in charge of like building out the API for us like falls out a window or something, has a really bad day, right? This is actually an application. It's only fake because of the, what I'm returning. I could take any of those handler methods, change what those helper methods were hooked up to, and I could replace it with real stuff. You know, the, the uh, request to get those contacts, for example, could have been actually turned around and um, hooked up to a call to active record, or, or I could use the SQL gem to talk to a database, or y you name it. You know, really, the only reason this was fake was because we were sort of stubbing our way in from the outside. Um, the other nice thing about this too, and we'll get to that to a second, is because I had this feedback loop going, I had something for their, a their API to compare to once they actually got it up and running. So we'll do a couple of beginner rounds and that leads me directly to like testing it, right? I did want to test it, I did want to make sure it worked, I didn't want to keep hitting curl and throwing stuff in there. I didn't want to have to remember what the token was, you know. So what I did was I used the curb gym and I wrote my little request runner script. And yeah, curb is awesome. It's this great little wrapper around curl lib, which is just CURL, and it just lets you make requests over HTTP through the command line. And the nifty thing about it is you can always take whatever your response back was and throw it into a variable and then use it for something else later, like hitting the same API over and over with the same request token. So um, it works really well for me, and I'll just show you one little chunk of my little request runner script. And, and, and this could be dried up a little bit. I was just kind of in a hurry. But you know, basically, we're just kind of figuring out where we're going. We're figuring out I don't want to print out all the verbose output. Um, and then you know, I'm just setting up kind of what my username and passwords are, et cetera. Uh, we'll come down in here to, yeah, or login, right? So I'm just going where I'm going with username and password, passing those in as arguments. I'm saying that right now I'd like to make a request through multi-part. And uh, right now I'm saying I don't want verbose output. I'm getting back the result and just throwing it into token after I parse the response body. And now I've got my token to work with for all my other requests. So 
It's not too hard. I recommend looking into it if you just need to hit something. And again, the nice thing was once they got their API up and running, I just changed what domain was pointed to, and I hit theirs with the same tool I used to test mine. <laughs> Another bonus round is live reloading changes over a LAN. Okay, so if you've played with Sinatra and then you've played with Rails, you might have noticed something. Um, when it comes to live reloading your changes or like say you've actually got your app loaded on your phone and you want to hit it on your laptop, okay? The bad news is Sinatra doesn't do either of those things out of the box. Um, you know, Rails will reload your object stack above application RB every time you make changes. We're really spoiled with that, so you can keep refactoring one of your models and see your changes on every request. Um, and, and again, it listens on every interface by default, so you can hit it from some other machine on your LAN. But it's not hard to make that happen. Um, for the live reloading, there's this great gem called Shotgun, and you basically just use that in place of a, a straight request to Ruby, and it Live reloads all your changes by just doing a process fork and getting a fresh copy of your app on every request. So instead of just doing Ruby, your script, you just do shotgun, your script. And then, again, server arguments really kind of fix, take us the rest of the way home. Um, you know, basically you can pass it this little argument 0.0.0.0 and it's going to listen on every interface. And that means requests coming in over your um, network card are going to become available to you as well. And in fact, if you're using it with shotgun, all that works, and you can even throw your port number on the end and uh, hit it on the port you were expecting to. So that was really kind of, uh, that was it, you know? We started with a big need, we avoided using a big tool, and we threw it together in a very small amount of code. Um, so I guess this is the part where I ask if you have any questions. Okay, guys, well, thanks. Uh, I knew we blew through it, uh, through it really quickly. Um, I'm on uh, Twitter if you want to uh, reach out to me, but in the meantime, just go to uh, Bitbucket, my first initial, my last name, and Sinatra Demo API. You can pull it down, play with it at your leisure. Feel free. Thanks a lot.